Pew, pew. Welcome to another episode of The J Situation. Today, we have another thermal product review for you. This is a first look at the Pulsar Accolade XP50 Thermal Binoculars. This is the case that contains the binoculars that are received from Pulsar. It's a pretty good, pretty sturdy, adjustable nylon strap. Uh, the case itself appears to be nylon. Seems to be pretty durable. The case also has some lanyard loops at the top. Being a binocular case, you can see how those could come in handy for your strap. On the front of the case, there's uh, a pocket that closes with Velcro. Inside that, you can store your standard Pulsar remote control. Uh, this lets you operate functions of the binoculars uh, and uh, other Pulsar weapon sites remotely without having to put your hands on the site. You can also store the standard Pulsar cam actuated battery charger. You have the standard 5 volt uh, 2 amp wall adapter. And you have the Pulsar USB cable. Uh, this is a micro USB size cable and again um, like Pulsar's uh, other sites and monoculars it has the radius uh, USB plug uh, so it kinda only fits in one way uh, into the site. So you've seen all that stuff before uh, so let's get to the meat of it here. So opening up the case, uh, we have the main unit. So this is the Accolade XP50. This is a little bit dirty as I've been using it out in the field. Um, but starting off you can see right away it does come with the neck strap. Pulsar logo right there. Uh, it's kind of rubberized, so kind of a non-slip type texture. The next strap connects to the uh, glass reinforced polymer body by way of some eyelet connections there and there. Pretty standard stuff. So again, this is the Accolade. XP50. So this is part of their uh, XP series of thermal sites, um, and because it's the XP50, it contains the thermal lens made of germanium glass on the front that has a 50 millimeter focal length. Uh, the diameter, just to clarify, is 42 millimeters. The lens cap, as you can see flips down and when you flip it down you can actually flip it all the way to the bottom there so it's out of the way. And flipping it back up, get an audible click um, and it stays in place. This lens allows for um, a native two and a half uh, times zoom at native magnification and then using the digital magnification in, in the electronics of the site, you're able to uh, ramp that up to 20x. Um, so that's, that's quite a bit. Like the other XP thermal sites from Pulsar, uh, this has a 640 by 480 resolution uh, a, a sensor array. Um, and of course the pixels are the 17 micron size. Like the other sites, it has the onboard storage capability with uh, 8 gigabytes uh, of memory. Um, it has onboard Wi-Fi capability um, and that allows you to uh, download uh, videos and photographs from the site um, and actually also uh, to connect to the StreamVision application um, 
with your phone or tablet or other device and you can upgrade the firmware like that. Uh, the site is also uh, IPX7 water, uh, water resistant so what that means is you can throw this this site in, uh, in one meter uh, depth of water and um, for, for an hour uh, and then uh, pull it out and it should be alright. When you hold the Accolade, um, like other Pulsar sites, it pr feels pretty sturdy in the hand. When I hold it, I don't feel like I'm going to break it. Uh, I don't feel like if I drop it, it's really going to be an issue. Um, other than, of course, uh, protecting the lens as uh, intermedium glass is sort of the expensive part of uh, these type of electronic devices. Uh, we already went over the lens cap. But uh, one important thing, um, if you're not familiar with uh, Pulsar uh, thermal site products, is that uh, Pulsar uses an in internal shutter uh, on their sites to do a non-uniformity uh, calibration uh, for the temperature sensor. So when you use a thermal, uh, you can turn it on, and when you turn it on, uh, it's going to uh, need to acclimate uh, to the ambient temperature. Even when left on, as uh, internal temperature uh, of the elect electronics change, as uh, the ambient temperature changes, you start to get sort of a drift in calibration. So what you want to do is you want to what we call uh, nuking the site. You want to hit the nuke, and what you do, you hit the the nuke button. And with some thermal sites, you have to have the shutter closed or the lens cap closed to do that and it can kind of uh, honestly be a, kind of the pain in the neck. Um, Pulsar has done a thing where you have your lens cap open you hit the nuke button and uh, it nukes with a shutter internal to the to the site so that's something that the user really doesn't have to interact with so I think that's pretty cool. On the left hand side of the site there's sort of a rubberized uh, grip texture Right next to that grip is the micro USB port. So the micro USB port is used along with the included cable to either charge the site without disconnecting the battery or connect it to your computer to download videos and photos uh, that you've taken with the device during use. Flipping to the bottom of the site, you see the Pulsar has chosen to place the heat sink in this area and also they've placed the quarter inch tripod uh, uh, receptacle um, right there in the heat sink body. Okay, so this, this female uh, quarter inch adapter here, let me kind of get this close to the camera so you can see it. That's a pretty standard adapter and I was actually using that um, a week ago with my Primos trigger stick. So, you know, you can put any tripod adapter on there that's a quarter inch diameter and the threads per inch are pretty standardized. So, something you, you probably noticed was adjacent to the heat sink on the bottom, you have the battery latch. On other Pulsar sites, you've seen this on the top. Well, they put it on the bottom this time. So you can lift that lever up, and when you do so, the battery can be disconnected. And again, like the other Pulsar sites that use all these same batteries, you have uh, cam latches that when actuated with the lever act to lock the battery cam lugs into place. And so you see the, the actual electrical contacts of the battery um, are in the center uh, of the system and they do have a gasket with a progressively increasing diameter as you go toward the, inter the connection interface so that when you place the battery uh, into the binocular body that locks in place and that's already that's already water resistant 
um, just by nature of the mechanical connection, and then you lock it in place uh, with the cam lever right there. So one thing that I thought was pretty cool about the way they laid out the Accolade binoculars is the way they decided to implement the button layout. So when you look at the top and you hold binoculars like you would hold them in the field, you have four buttons on top. On the left, my left, you have the power button. This power button functions like it does on all Pulsar sites, uh, serving to both uh, turn on the site, turn off the site, and also reach the display off mode um, in which you can only turn off the display in order to save power when you're not using the optic for a certain period of time. It does have the standard uh, up and down buttons. The up button, uh, in addition to cycling through menu options, uh, it toggles between the color palettes, white hot, black hot, and in the case of the Accolade, um, like the Helion series of uh, thermal monoculars, uh, will allow you to select white hot or um, other color palettes in addition to black hot, such as red hot, sepia, um, and uh, others. The down button, in addition to, again, helping you cycle through menu functions, uh, operates the zoom. So uh, this site, like the Helion, has some preset zoom levels. So you have your native magnification of 2.5x, and each time you press uh, that button, it's going to pop you to double the mag. So you're going to have 2.5 mag, you're going to hit it once, it'll go to 5, hit it again, uh, it'll go to 10, hit it one more time, it'll go to 20x. Now you can, um, using the middle button, the menu function, um, activate the smooth zoom in which you can step through uh, your uh, zoom gradations at, at a finer adjustment. Uh, you know, if you need um, some kind of, you know, uh, zoom level that's not uh, a multiple of the uh, native magnification 2.5x. I actually, in practice, I rarely use that function just because uh, I'm often using the picture-in-picture, -picture, in which case I will hold the zoom button down and it puts the little window at the top of your screen and you have your native mag uh, in the whole window with your zoomed-in magnification at the top so then you really don't have to worry about switching back and forth. So another thing they did was they actually put, and I'll turn this so you can read it, they actually put an R um, on the right hand side of the binoculars for record. Uh, on the other Pulsar sites that button has just been blank uh, but now there's no mistake in it uh, that's your record button. So one really cool thing about having these buttons on top and kind of in an array sort of like a cross is that they're very easy to actuate. So you know, when you're holding binoculars, a lot of people hold, when they hold them with two hands, you're going to have your fingers up here anyway. So having the menu button and the arrow buttons uh, kind of in one line like that uh, provides for a really, really easy, easy tactile feel. And having the power button here, which you use way more than you think, because um, I tend to leave the, the sight on a semi-automatic uh, nuking mode. So what semi-automatic does is it says, okay, I know I need a nuke um, eventually, uh, but uh, I'm also going to let you nuke when you want to. And uh, so when I'm viewing objects through a thermal, I really like to get the clearest image possible. So when I notice there are uh, vertical lines uh, forming on the screen and the image is getting a little fuzzy, I know, that, I know that's because uh, heat has transferred um, to an area of the site and it's creating um, some kind of temperature differential between the environment and the internals that was not accounted for during the last uh, non-uniformity calibration. So when I know I need a nuke, I tap that button and having that button right there with no confusion and other buttons in line with it is pretty awesome. And furthermore, 
um, since this is a spotting um, this is a, a spotting appliance this is a spotting optic you're gonna be recording a lot at least I, I do uh, you know this isn't a mounted on a weapon this is for observing and one of the things you want to do when you observe is you want to capture the the moments that you're observing so the record function um, and uh, the functionality can change depending on when you hold the button down to, to take a photograph, um, hold it down to actuate video mode, um, or press the button to start a recording, press the button again to pause that recording, and then resume. Um, it's, again, right here on the right. There's nothing else to confuse it with. So I found that actually I've made a lot less mistakes when using this site than I have with my Helion spotting monocular simply because although the Helion has a very good button layout and the buttons are all in a line this one kind of takes some of the guesswork out of it because two of them are offset so it's just been really good for me in the dark I've done a little bit better with it moving aft to the rear of the site you see something that is actually common on uh, Pulsar's uh, XP line of sights, and that's an objective focus. So with the daytime binocular, your, uh, your objective focus is typically there as well. So this focus knob can be rotated just like a typical binocular focus knob. And what that's doing is it's, it's moving uh, mechanically the lens inside the sight body uh, for and aft to let you focus uh, the objective lens on what you're looking at. And like the Helion, I believe the closest uh, clear magnification you can get is about 10 feet um, approximately, uh, and that's, that's kind of been my experience. So you can focus in pretty, pretty close. So another thing that is actually a requirement <laughs> in my mind, um, for a thermal binocular or any binocular is the interpupillary distance adjustment. So interpupillary distance is the uh, horizontal distance between your pupils, uh, basically the distance between your eyes. And uh, as you know, with a traditional uh, optical uh, binocular, something that's not um, a digital sight like this, you would be able to usually uh, actuate the side body and then that change in angle will usually with a hinge like typical binoculars have would then change your horizontal interpupillary distance between the two eyepieces. Well that's not going to fly on a site like this um, for uh, a few reasons uh, mainly uh, being cost of manufacturing. So what Pulsar has done is you can hold the site like this, clasp the eyepieces at the base where they meet the side body and you can pull apart or pull together and that change in distance should fit a wide variety of folks. Uh, it, hit, it fit me just fine, uh, fit my girlfriend in Victoria just fine. Uh, we had a lot of people uh, using this uh, last weekend and they were all able to find a pretty comfortable spot. So, talking more about adjustment, if you move further aft, you can move your eye cup shield just like you would with the Helion, but in between there, if you look, you have these little notches, and those help you actuate the diopter. And there are diopters for each eye. So, the way I adjusted this for my eyes was to turn the side on. I adjusted the interpupillary distance for my face. Then I closed one eye and with the open eye I adjusted the diopter until the screen and the uh, numerals and letters in the, in the status bar were in focus. And then I closed that eye, opened the other eye, and did the same thing with this one. Adjust the diopter. After that, it was kind of a set it, set it and forget it thing. Didn't really have to mess with that uh, at all. Uh, unless, of course, um, other folks are using it. But again, 
you're gonna run into that with any optic you use, thermal optic, daytime optic, whatever, right? Because everyone's eyes are different. So you may be asking yourself, well man, why would I buy a thermal binocular? I mean, I could just as easily buy a thermal monocular, like this Helion right here. So this is my personal Helion XP50. I'll have to do a video on this um, later. I've been using it so much, I haven't really sat down and reviewed it. Yeah, um, I went ahead and bought a Helion uh, because uh, I really like the, the lightweight. I like the form factor. Um, I like the way I can adjust my objective lens. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, in general, I really, really strongly recommend a dedicated spotting monocular or spotting binocular or spotting optic in general for use in night hunting. And night hunting is something I like to do. What you don't want to be doing is you do not want to be uh, holding your weapon um, up to your face. And uh, not only does that get heavy, uh, if you are... Um, scanning to uh, perform target identification or identification in general. Uh, sweeping uh, a loaded weapon over all targets is, is some, sometimes not something you want to do. Sometimes that's inevitable, but you know, sometimes you don't want to do that. So by having a dedicated spotter, whether that be a monocular or a binocular, uh, is, is a very useful thing. One thing I've noticed when I use the Helion Man, this screen is bright. Uh, it only uh, kills the night vision in one of my eyes, which is pretty awesome. So then when I take it down uh, from my eyes, I can still see. And while my uh, right eye, because I'm right eye dominant, and that's the one I use with the Helion, uh, when that right eye is recovering, I have my left eye. Uh, to kind of help me navigate around until uh, my ride kind of catches up and acclimates and then I'm good to go. So going into this, when I got the uh, accolade uh, to test and take out to the field, man, my preconceived notion honestly was this is going to suck for my eyes. Uh, I'm going to be blind and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really going to need to rely on my buddy to uh, go ahead and spot for me um, in situations where um, I might need to take my optic down from my face and then re-engage with something else or do another activity that's going to require both my eyes. So um, I was a little um, a little concerned about that. That was actually uh, you know one of the only reservations I had about that the Accolade system. Uh, and I can honestly say that I'm I've been very surprised in that the ocular fatigue or the I guess the the eye fatigue. Uh, that I perceived using Accolade is not bad and actually it's better than the, the Helion. Now, I think there's two reasons for that. So the first reason um, I think uh, is that I, I've spent a lot of time looking through both of these, these sites and I feel like the Accolade screen just isn't as bright even on the brightest setting. I don't know if that's if that's me perceiving the way they've set the screen into the eyepieces, um, I don't know if that's the actual uh, internal brightness setting or what, but that's something I noticed right away. When I have the brightness jacked all the way up uh, on both units, uh, the Helion seems a little brighter to my eye. Uh, the Accolade doesn't seem like it's too dim, so it seems to have all the brightness capability it needs. It just doesn't seem to be quite as bright. Uh, but the other thing that I think is going on uh, may be a physiological uh, issue uh, using a monocular versus a binocular. When you have both eyes open uh, and you're looking through um, the viewfinder simultaneously with both eyes, uh, I did a little research on this and uh, I had the feeling that it would be easier on your eyes and it turns out uh, it kind of is. Uh, when you have both eyes open, it just seems like a more relaxed uh, relaxed uh, state for your eyes. Um, I don't know I don't know if that's because of the way that certain eye muscles uh, behave when you close one eye uh, versus the other eye and and I don't know if some kind of fatigue uh, develops like that. I don't know if if maybe there's some kind of 
uh, focusing issue when you have one eye closed for a long time. I don't know if it tries to compensate in some way. Um, I know the eye muscles are very complex uh, and the eye is a very complex organ. So um, I'm going to do a little more research on that. But right now, I can tell you through practical use and real field use, you know, despite all the, the theory I just talked about, the accolade is not as fatiguing as you would think. And I've had I've had two to three other people spend a lot of time behind the behind the helion and I agree with them when you take this down from your face you, your eyes blasted uh, it, it could be that that I I jack up the brightness just cuz I I'm, I'm a really big fan of detail maybe I just need to be better at that at night but this will blast your eye and we spend a lot of time spotting cuz we have a lot of ground to cover so you know, this is pretty lightweight, pretty easy to hold up to your face. So that's just one thing to think about. You're going to spend more money on the Accolade, but if you're not worried about cost and uh, you want a full featured uh, spotting system uh, with excellent thermal for excellent long range detection capabilities, I mean, this is going to be hard to beat. It has all the features that uh, the XP50 line of uh, Pulsar sites have, you know, the Trail, the Helion, and now the Accolade. You know, you have this 42 millimeter diameter lens with a 50 millimeter focal length. Uh, you're, you're detecting thermal targets out past a thousand yards, you know, almost 2,000 yards. So that's, that's pretty incredible. And it's durable. You don't think like, you don't feel like you're going to break it. Uh, I'm telling you, the, the glass reinforced polymer construction of these sites, they're they're really strong and uh, I, I, I really don't have a fear of breaking them. The only thing that I really remain cognizant of when I'm using these out in the field is I like to keep my lens caps uh, covered when I'm not using them. Uh, and that's just uh, kind of a, a habit and a good practice uh, just because I know that germanium is expensive, you know, and you have to use that for thermal sites and, and so that's what you want to protect. But just like any other optic, if those get dirty, you know, you can blow them off with with uh, your air duster and you can use some kind of safe solvent like an isopropyl alcohol and a, you know a, a very soft a cotton swab you know using light pressure you can clean it off just like you can on any other lens but again you know you can feel free to you know throw these around throw them in the dirt uh, throw them in the water uh, you know you probably wouldn't do that on pur purpose but if it does happen uh, you don't really have to worry about it and Pulsar has a pretty good warranty too and they're good folks over there they tend to take care of them you know they take care of the product, they take care of the customers. So let's talk about size really quick. How big are these things? I know you can see them in my hands, but uh, that might not give you a good frame of reference. So, all right. Here's the Accolade next to the Helion XP50. So that kind of gives you an idea A footprint. What if we change the battery out? So I have one of these Pulsar extended batteries uh, just because I think it's awesome and it basically allows you to use your spotter or your weapon sight all night long, not even worry about the battery at all. Um, although I should say the standard battery lasts a pretty long time too, uh, but with the extended battery it's almost guaranteed that you're not going to have to worry about it, uh, which is uh, not something you can say for all uh, night vision and thermal products. So, uh, you know, I, I really, I, I feel like I don't see people talking about that enough and this is just a plug again for these batteries. I think they are one of the best features um, of the uh, the Pulsar products, and they're they're common uh, across a lot of the different product lines. So uh, you know, get you some of these, man, especially this big one. So anyway, so you take you know take the cover off. It comes with same as anything, uh, same as any of the batteries you're going to use. So you open the cam, take off the small or standard battery, and you can. Lock in the big one, boom. So now you have the Accolade with the extended battery. 
So that's as big as this device is going to get. And I guess I have normal size hands. So if I kind of grab around the extended battery right there, I can still reach the record button. Um, it might be a little bit of a stretch for me to reach the other buttons, but I can. But again, you can do that easily with your other hand. And, you know, if you can't for some reason, uh, you can use this hand for all in one. But with a rubberized grip on the Accolade, I kind of liked it no matter what, have my left hand on there. Uh, it's pretty secure. I like it. So you may be saying, oh, well, so that still doesn't give me an idea how big it is. Like, okay. Let's get something else for some more frames of reference here. Let's see what I have around the, the bench. Well, on top, I have a 30-round uh, AR-15 PMAG from Magpul. This is a very standard item. And to the right of the Accolade, uh, the left on your screen, I have my Leupold 10x42 BX4 uh, daytime optics. And on the left, or the right on your screen, I have the Helon XP50. So the PMAG is shorter than the Helion. Longer than the XP50 Accolade. And comparing the thermal binoculars to a typical 10 by 42 daytime optic, you see they're very comparable in size. Very, very actually surprisingly comparable in size. That's the first time I kind of had those sitting together. So I kind of hope that helps give you um, kind of a frame of reference. Uh, practically with some different items. So when using the Accolade uh, binoculars um, during you know nighttime use or daytime use, uh, I really haven't noticed um, a difference in quality uh, when compared to using the Helion. Uh, other than the uh, the brightness differentiation uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there is um, one thing uh, that's not really a quality difference, but it's actually a difference in overall viewing experience. So when you use the Accolade, again, um, as I've gone over, you're using both eyes at once. So the first thing that does is it reduces fatigue, like we talked about. But the other thing it does is it kind of gives you a little bit of spaciousness to your view. Now, remember, a big disclaimer here, these are not optical sights in the traditional sense in that you're not looking through a lens that's focusing light onto another lens. What you're doing is you're looking through focused lenses that are focused on a screen. And the objective lens is gathering information to project on that screen digitally. Okay, so make no mistake, these devices are not traditional optics, okay? You can, keep, you can think of these as very high-end thermal digital cameras. So, with that in mind, that idea in mind, um, when you look through the Accolade, you are looking at the internal screen in the site with both eyes. So when you look through the site with both eyes, what you end up seeing is instead of the screen projection uh, that you see through the single eyepiece of the Helion, what you end up seeing is basically almost like a TV screen or a movie screen. It's as if you're looking through one of those old school uh, Viewmaster viewfinders you may have used when you were a kid, and you look through here and it's like you're looking at a really big screen in front of you. So you're not getting depth perception of the objects in front of you um, and so that's that's kind of what I'm I'm alluding to when I'm when I'm talking about the differentiation between a true, a true optical sight and a digital sight so you're not getting that type of depth perception but you are getting a depth perception onto the internal screen and that alone uh, does change your viewing experience 
I hope you found this first look at the Pulsar Accolade XP50 thermal binoculars uh, to be informative and hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'll try to respond to them in a timely fashion. Uh, please subscribe to the channel and stay tuned uh, for more reviews of cool outdoor firearm products. Thanks again.